Guide, CNT 140, Chapter 12. We're looking at the section now on fiber attenuation. Alrighty. Attenuation is our loss of signal when we're talking electrical connections. When we're talking fiber optic, it's the loss of light. Uh, you can almost think of this as a garden hose, and you're connecting two garden hoses together. If it's not a tight fitting, we're going to have lots of water squirt out. That's loss of water. Uh, if I have two fiber connections coming together and it's not a tight connection, I'm going to have light lost in the connection and it's going to attenuate. Well, attenuation can happen going down through the fiber anyway, uh, and the two main causes of attenuation or loss of light as a signal travels down a fiber optic is through absorption or scattering, and scattering being the largest cause. But let's, let's talk absorption first. Uh, absorption is when light is actually absorbed and turned into heat from the molecules in the glass. So right here, it's actually um, some of these molecules, some of the light, some of the light signal as it's traveling down hits these molecules and turns into heat. And uh, this occurs strongly in the 1,000, 1,400, and above 1,600 nanometer wavelengths. Um, so those areas are avoided, those wavelengths of light are avoided as we're sending signals down a piece of fiber optic cable. Um, and that's where they actually they show you the, this graph in the book showing you that uh, absorption happens a lot around 1,000 nanometers, a lot around 14, uh, yeah, 1,000 nanometers, around, a lot around 1,400 nanometers. Yeah, 1,400 nanometers and above 1,600 nanometers. So those are avoided. Those bandwidth windows, if you will, are avoided. The second main cause is scattering. So let's take a look at this one now. Scattering is when light collides with individual atoms in the glass. Um, well, the glass itself is made up of uh, little little silica matrix and there's actually metallic ions in there that act almost like little mirrors. So as the light is traveling down through the fiber optic, it actually reflects uh, these little particles of light actually reflect off these metallic ions and get reflected either back to the source or out of the core of the fiber. So as light is traveling down through a piece of fiber optic, it hits these little metallic ions and they reflect off. Uh, and again, that is signal loss. That's attenuation of fiber. That's the bigger cause of problem in fiber optic and again uh, one of the reasons these bands are avoided is because it happens a lot in those bands. Uh, so fiber optic systems avoid the uh, 1,000, 1,400, and above 1,600 nanometers and tend to transmit in the 850 window, the 1310 window, and the 1550 window. Those are the windows where the least, the least of these problems occur if you will. And again, reminding you, longer wavelengths of light are going to get you greater distance with less attenuation. Okay, That's why your single modes use those higher wavelengths of light. The bandwidth of fiber is limited by two other factors, modal dispersion and chromatic dispersion. Well, modal dispersion, again, multi-mode, single mode, modal dispersion occurs mainly in step index multi-mode fiber because as this, as I look at these two modes of light, the red one and the blue one, the angles that they enter the fiber here, this red one is going to bounce back and forth a lot more and travel a greater distance, so therefore is going to get there after the blue one. So your step index fiber tends to cause more modal dispersion, the light bouncing down more and some, some of the light signal getting there early and some of it getting late. It's going to disperse, it's going to spread out, if you will. Uh, so gradient index tends to be used to fix that problem. And what they actually do is kind of neat. Um, as, the, as the light leaves the core, this actually... Um, the, the layers out here, the indices of refraction are controlled very carefully to cause the light to bend and actually speed up and get back to the core quicker. So as it's leaving this core, it's actually, it's traveling a greater distance, but they actually cause it to bend and speed up so it gets back to the core quicker. And the idea being all these modes are going to arrive at the end at about the same time. Pretty amazing stuff, really. Uh, so gradient genetics tends to help with this problem. The other type of dispersion is chromatic dispersion. Chromatic dispersion is caused by the light wavelengths traveling at different speeds. Um, 
as it's moving down the fiber. If you think of sending light through a prism, I don't think I have that picture in here. If you send light through a prism, it breaks it out of the Roy G. Biv into our rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Uh, well, those wavelengths of light are all slightly different and they actually travel at slightly different speeds um, hence when we run them through a prison they bend out like that well as I start bending light and moving it down through a fiber I tend to have some wavelengths of light get there a little bit quicker than the other ones so chromatic dispersion is caused by different wavelengths of light, light traveling at slightly different speeds down through the fiber. One of the things that can be done to minimize this is control the spectral width of your light source. An LED light source, uh, if I have an 850 nanometer LED light light source, uh, the spectral width is going to be rather large. I might actually have, and I'm going to exaggerate, uh, wavelengths of light from 800 to 900. You know, so you have 850 in the middle and I have, you know, a about 50 nanometers of wavelength below it and 50 nanometer waves wavelength above it that's a lot of wavelengths of light as they start moving down the fiber they're going to start moving uh, at different rates down through the fiber and I'm going to have a lot of dispersion because of that meanwhile if I have a laser light source um, again let's just say I have an 850 nanometer uh, laser light source I might only have 840 to 860 in wavelengths of light a 20 nanometer spectral width light source, there's a lot, lot less wavelengths of light, lots less wavelengths of light to travel at different rates down through the fiber. So a lot less dispersion because I have a lot less wavelengths of light being launched into the fiber step one. So your chromatic dispersion, that can be minimized or controlled with the, the spectral width of your light source, the better quality light source, if you will. And that's what they're trying to show you with that there. With, with, with those those pictures, those examples. The next area they mention is bending losses. Yes, we have to make sure um, glass itself is actually very strong material, uh, but if I bend it too much, I tend to fracture it, and I get losses because of that, either being bent too strong or I'm stressing it and actually causing fractures, fractures in it. So I remind you our 568C3 standard actually has in bending radii for different types of fiber that should be followed, uh, different types of fiber that I would be installing. Follow those guidelines. The fiber optic itself, so now we're going to start talking the cable itself. Remember that the outside jacket is there to protect the fiber, and depending on the use inside or outside, my cable is going to be constructed different ways to handle those needs. Okay, so uh, one of the first things they mention is if I have some outside cable, outside uh, outside plant cabling, I might run into some things like this. Here's a type of aerial fiber optic cable that actually, it almost looks like a figure eight if you were to look at it from the end. Uh, the top half of the cable is actually a steel cable that would get anchored to like telephone poles. And then the bottom half of the figure eight is a tube that the smaller fibers are in. So the weight is being... Uh, the weight of the cable is being anchored and supported by the steel cable and the fibers are going along almost like a little hammock or cradle underneath it uh, so they don't get stressed and broken. So there might be an aerial cable for um, installing outside between telephone poles. Here's an armored cable that would get installed underground between two buildings. In this case I have a jacket that's designed to withstand the elements uh, underground temperatures blah. I have a layer of armoring uh, that's almost like a heavy foil shield if you will heavy foil shield uh, that's there to protect from critters chewing through as well as the ground freezing and thawing and moving and causing the cable you know possibly to break. There is actually a water barrier in here and sometimes there's actually a gel in here too. Um, you can almost think of it as like jelly from a jelly donut. There's a gel in there to protect the um, inside cables from water and damage as well as, this will sound weird, um, that gel is there to keep critters from chewing it. Uh, the nickname for that is Icky Pick uh, because the critter goes to chew through it, it's like Icky, ugh, and it's going to be a deterrent. They will not want to chew through the cable. I kid you not. Go look it up if you want to. And then I actually have the fibers inside down here. 
So that'd be an armor cable for installing outside or underground. And then we mentioned this one before, underwater fiber optic cable uh, for being installed under the ocean or on the ocean floor, if you will. And not under the ocean, but in the water, in the ocean, on the ocean floor, if you will. And I've reminded, or I showed you this before, actually uh, maps of fiber optic cables around the world. There is plenty of them. So these actually need to be laid on the ocean floor and they need to be designed to withstand all kinds of elements, including critters trying to bite on them. Okay. As I move inside, I have a couple different types of fiber that I might run into. Uh, this is one picture that kind of shows them all, but let's take a look at each one. Um, here's here's our fiber optic cable itself. Uh, they, they, rem they remind you of the construction of it, so I put the picture back in here to remind you the core cladding strength fibers cable jacket. And they also remind you in here about the labels on the outside. Well, this should be a good review of what we mentioned before. The National Electrical Code 770 has labels on here to show you whether it's general purpose riser or plenum. Remember, just look at this last letter, and that's going to tell you general riser or plenum, OFNP, OFNR, and so forth. And here's kind of a close-up to get you to see OFNP, there it is, OFNP, and then OFNR, riser there. Okay? Look for that last letter. And then the book talks about a couple different cable types, so let's take a look. First one they mention is zip cord, simple cable zip cord. This is probably the one that you would most encounter. It's two strands, send and receive, uh, connect together almost like a figure eight. That's your commonly gets used as patch cable or cord between switches, if you will, or between closets. Distribution cable actually is one large jacket with a number of smaller fibers inside. Again, this could get used uh, between floors uh, in a building, that sort of thing. And then here's a breakout cable. This might actually get installed between buildings and here I actually have almost like four bundles of fibers one two three four and then each bundle has a handful of fibers in them so I can almost break this out and send a bundle to each zone in a building that sort of thing and then they also make a loose tube as you see this would be kind of like an outside armored cable and loose tube single mode fiber connecting camp you know side a of campus to side b of campus if you will they do have a couple other types of fiber. Here's a ribbon cable. Uh, this is a newer type of fiber optic cable. This one's flat, so you can get, um, or should take up less space, so you can get more fibers in a tray kind of deal. High fiber count, small space. And then another type they briefly mention with you is air blown fiber. Uh, and I wanted to show you an example of that. What actually gets installed is this, uh, it's almost like a cable of tubes, almost like a cable of straws. And the idea is you install this, and then as you need fiber, you actually blow the fiber optic through. Almost think of it like sucking, uh, a sucking, putting a shot back on the end and sucking the fiber through, if you will. The fiber itself, the outside insulation is a little bit rough, uh, kind of like the idea of like a golf ball, that you can suck the fiber through the tube. Um, so you install these tubes, and then as you need fiber, the pathways are already there, you just... Suck another one through, uh, and now you have a fiber that you can terminate and use. This actually was you. I've I've read articles on this being used, and one of the neat ones I read was uh, they installed this when they were doing the shuttle launches a number of years ago. They installed the air blown fiber up to the up through the tower up to the shuttle entrance uh, to basically connect into the shuttle. And the idea was they installed these tubes, and they could add fiber as almost willing, I shouldn't say willy-nilly, as needed uh, for connection into the, the shuttle orbiter very quickly. Kind of a neat neat, uh, neat application. Then they mentioned a color code for you. While well, I pull up our standard and say, hey, here's our color code of our fiber and fiber connectors in our standard. We'll follow that because that's the one we encounter. So the color code is telling you the type of fiber and even the type of connector that you have on the end. Color code's important. Uh, connectors then, hopefully you should remember these from 120, but I put a quick picture in here to show you some of the different types of connectors that you run into. SCST, MTRJ, LC, and even broke them out in a, uh, another example here for you so you can see them a little bit better. I'm going to pause, I'll come back in the last one and talk about installing fiber.